Hello there, I'm Tiki Fullerton. Every night bringing you a full hour of the very best in business coverage across the nation and internationally, especially where business and politics meet. Well, coming up, the battle for insolvency premacy. KPMG takes on insolvency gurus Ferrier Hodgson. Our exclusive TV interview with one of the new unit co-heads, KPMG's Matthew Woods. Also, CBA's Matt Common puts the bank's demerger of its wealth and mortgage broking business on pause until the Royal Commission cleanup is sorted. All the latest intel behind that decision with Leo Shanahan and former Victorian Premier and Chair of the Australia-China Business Council joins me to talk the Australia-China relationship at a time of trade tensions, Huawei tip for tats and a slowing economy in the Middle Kingdom. Well, let's go first to CBA, who, which has suspended the demerger of its wealth management and mortgage broking business. The bank says the pause button, a button has been hit to allow it to focus on implementing the recommendations of the Royal Commission inquiry, as I say. However, the bank reiterated that it was still committed to ultimately exiting its wealth management and mortgage broking businesses. Earlier this week, the big banks were criticised by ASIC for dragging their heels when it came to implementing recommendations from Hain into the banks. And CEO Matt Common admitted there was still a lot of work to be done to address the Commission's concerns about widespread misconduct at the bank. Well, for more on this, Your Money's Chief Business Reporter, Leo Shanahan, joins me live at the desk. Uh, Leo, what was the stated reason now for, for Matt Common yeah, to the, do this? The stated reason was to focus on remuneration and compensation for victims of fee for no service and other scandals that have beset the bank over the last few years yeah. and focus on implementing the recommendations of the Royal Commission. Yeah. But implicit with that is the fact that there is a whole series of problems still with these companies mm. and that's their real problem. The companies that they want to demerge? They want to demerge. Aussie home loans and especially these wealth businesses, uh, Count Financial, Wisdom Financial, mm. uh, as well as even Colonial, even though it doesn't have as many problems, uh, that policy area is changing. So you've got this combination of basically regulatory contamination mm. and policy that's constantly shifting at the moment, especially in relation to mortgage broking. But if, for starters, if we focus on the wealth businesses, yes. I mean, as you said in the intro earlier in the week, as we discussed, uh, ASIC fingered out uh, account financial and, and wisdom mm. for not doing enough in the reparations. Um, and this is after they've service. been charged with going going to sort it out. Yeah? Exactly. And then even then, they were differing over, over the definitions of when they, a customer should be entitled to a review or whether they just get offered a review or whether you just have to compulsor, compulsorily give them a review. So this is their problem. And Matt Common, as he alluded to last week mm. uh, in the uh, House of Representatives yeah, evidence. Yeah, because he was up chatting away to them. He, he can't, hand on heart, put this thing out there yeah. into the market and not say there's going to be another problem. Could you imagine yeah, if they floated this thing this year again and spun it off and all of a sudden there was another problem and they'd have another shareholder action? So, so that is you know the stated explanation and I have some sympathy uh, mm. for it because obviously there's a lot that needs to be done. Equally there are a couple of things that have gone uh, gone their way which might not have done which is firstly that Kenneth Hayne did not ban vertical integration mm. and secondly we've had this backflip from the government now on mortgage broking. I'm just wondering whether holding on to these, I know they are ultimately mm. going to be disposed of holding on to these might also leave their options open for a couple of things yeah well mortgage broking firstly I mean this goes to, to a policy setting that makes it very hard at the moment mm. to spin this business off because it's changing day to day we had the co we had the coalition a couple of days ago changing their position on this spin uh, on uh, trailing commission saying that well now we'll allow trailing commissions of 2020 and then have a review and we don't know who's I mean, going to win the election we don't know who's going to win the election labor have changed their policy seemingly on this twice as well saying we'll allow commissions but no trailing commissions so it's a very unsure policy setting and it's very hard for a business to be sold off in that in, in that environment but you're exactly right and mm -hmm. one does tend to think that maybe they're keeping these businesses in their back pocket now in the hope that maybe they still might be able to be worth something now I understand that the logic the within the CBA is that they do want to sell this off they're still very committed to selling off especially wealth and mortgage broking because really they think it is much more trouble than it's worth that Hain exposed the uh, conflicts of interest mm. within mortgage broking and wealth and 
in, in, from a public policy perspective, people just aren't going to cop it mm. and even, they even don't the more, see it as a viable side. business. I mean, after all, they're going back to basics, back to simple banking. They're going to be attacked on all sides. You, you interviewed ING yesterday. Yeah. Look at them, how they're growing. Um, wouldn't it be a, 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 an interesting idea to keep mortgage rates? Well, yes, but then you have this perennial problem where people complain that they're being shoved into CBA. And let's face it, What's the benefit of holding on to a mortgage broker like Aussie uh, if you're not going to shove them into the, your bank's loans that you own? I mean, that's why they did it, right? <laughs> and then, I mean, all this stuff about, oh, well, you know, we yeah. provide different advice, and, and that's what is going to curtail right. that behaviour. All right, Leah Shannon, great to get to your views. Thanks very much. Thanks again. OK, now, big news today. KPMG is set to acquire the Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane and Perth operations of restructuring specialist Ferrier Hodgson. The merger will create one of Australia's largest restructuring services and forensic advisory businesses with 27 partners and more than 200 specialists. Well, Matthew Woods, KPMG National Head of Restructuring Services, will lead the merged uh, service line. Matthew joins me now live from KPMG in Sydney. Matthew, congratulations on the, the new deal and your and your new position. Uh, fair to say this has been rumoured to be happening for some time but you've pulled it off. Yeah look thank you thank you very much for that it's a it's a great day um, for us uh, from KPMG and our team and our people and our clients and, and likewise it is for the Ferry Hodgson business so this is this is a combination of two leading teams in the market that has been in the the planning and uh, discussion and negotiation stages for, for about six months. Yes. And it's, um, it's, it's very, very pleasing to get to today where we've, where we've signed an agreement and we can, we can move forward. Yeah, two leading teams. I think on, on one estimate, you're the ninth largest insolvency firm. Ferry Hodgson was the third. So um, just what are you buying or what are you taking on in terms of um, human power and also, I guess, uh, clients? Yeah, sure. And just, just before I answer that question, just a bit of context in respect to the market, because I think that helps um, determine uh, the answer to that question. So the, mm. the market for restructuring services in Australia has um, evolved significantly over the last five past years. So mm. previously, the, the, the amount of solutions you could take to a, to a company that was showing signs of financial stress were generally limited to solvency um, related solutions but but the markets evolved now and more and more so it's the it's the borrower um, the debtor that is calling in people like uh, myself um, earlier where they're starting to see signs of stress in their business and to work on implementing holistic solutions to turn that business around right, is, that, um, is that partly that, sorry to interrupt is that partly because of the lowest lower interest rate climate do you think Look, that is, that is part of it. So, so it's a combination of things. It's certainly the lower interest rate environment helps um, because it, it means that banks can be more, more patient supporting a turnaround, which mm. can take, it can be complex and can take a period of time. So, so there is that to it. There's the government's new safe harbour legislation that uh -huh. provide directors with some protection from insolvent trading if they're pursuing a, a bona fide turnaround of their, their business. And the third thing is there's there are a significant amount of new players that have entered the Australian market um, that provide alternative, alternative capital solutions to, to financial stress. So when you put all that together, the solutions are far more uh, significant and, uh, uh, and powerful than, than what they have been before. OK, okay. now, so, of course, P PwC um, snapped up PPP advisory. Uh, what's Ferrier Hodgson delivering for you guys? Yeah, so, so we've, we've admired the Ferry Hodgson business for some time. It was, it was really the first um, leading independent restructuring mm. firm in, in Australia. And I'll, I'll tell you what the rationale is for us. So, so our clients are demanding more and more from us um, and demanding it earlier. So by that I mean they're not waiting for signs of solvency distress or, or insolvency, but they're coming to us and, and asking us for to help them uh, with business improvement or cost optimization or to make change in their business more generally. Um, we've, we've really struggled to meet the demand that our clients are putting on us. So what mm. Ferry Hodgson brings to us is, is over 40 years of experience and, and reputation in the marketplace, a diverse group of, of, of partners and directors that lead that business in, in all of the geographical locations that, that, that we operate in. And it gives us scale. So for, from a scale perspective, 
um, we'll go from uh, seven partners and about 45 people to to 20 odd partners and, and close to 200 people around Australia. So it enables us to be more fit and ready to go when our clients call for us. Right, now what are you going to do? I mean I gather uh, obviously they are a very experienced firm, been around for, around for a long time as you say. Some of those cats over there are, are, uh, are, are getting also getting a bit older. Uh, now KPMG has a retirement policy of 58, you look like you're a long way off that at the moment. Um, what are you going to do about some of the more distinguished Ferrier Hodgson fellows and fellowesses? Yeah, so I can certainly say that age is, was n not part of the factors that we considered when we when we looked at this transaction. So right. they're, they're, they're very much like us. They've got partners in, in their thirties, and then they've got very senior partners as well. So so age wasn't wasn't a factor or consideration. Um, and certainly in terms of the, the reference to us, you know, we've got we've got many partners that are over sixty in our practice and still highly valued, yes. um, and still serving our people and our clients well. So. Okay. Okay. Now you were very clever, almost mischievous, if I might say so, in uh, in doing this deal by, uh, uh, as I understand it, um, nipping the, uh, the the head of HR at Ferry Hodgson ahead a couple of uh, months ahead of actually <laughs> doing this deal. So that must have given you a bit of an insight to the to the partners and their their wants. Um, you haven't put a figure on on uh, on what's being paid, uh, but presumably everybody over there is pretty happy. Well, look, if, 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 if both sides of the deal weren't happy with the commercial terms of the deal, we, we, wouldn't, be announcing, um, we wouldn't be announcing the deal today. <laughs> so, so, yeah, look, everybody, everybody's pleased. Everybody's um, on the same page in terms of where we can take this combined business in the market. And that's really what, it, what we're focused on, on on both sides of the transaction. OK. Tell me about a, a couple of the big deals at the moment. I'm just looking at some of them in the press. I mean, I know um, Halifax will obviously be one, um, uh, Napoleon Purdy, obviously, um, uh, we've got some, you've got something to do with. Um, and uh, what are the other uh, big, big deals that you are working on at the moment, Matthew? Yeah, so those, those deals that you mentioned, Halifax and others, are um, Ferry Hodgson deals. So, mm. so um, I, should, I ought to leave it to them to to, to comment on those transactions. So, but yeah. in terms of um, in terms of some of the big deals we're doing at the moment, you'll appreciate that um, a client going through a, a restructuring process is quite a quite a confidential and sensitive process to them. Mm. So I won't mention I won't mention individual clients, but I will say this: um, we're doing quite a bit of work in the retail space at the moment. Yeah, boy, I bet um, you are. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, indeed, and that should that ought not to come to surprise to anyone. We continue to, we continue to do work across transport um, and uh, even though we've seen a general recovery in the last two years in commodity prices, there's still some structural change going through the mining services sector. So, okay. so we continue to have clients in that space as well. Very, very briefly, Matthew, when you say you know, your, your pitch to, to, to new customers, new clients, is, is really you can help, um, you can help perhaps avoid uh, going to a company ending up in a in a parlous state. What are the sort of things you can help with? Yeah, certainly. It, it, it goes from operational right through to capital structure. So I will say mm -hmm. this: that, that 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 neither neither of our two teams would profess to to hold a magic wand. So we're not going to be able to go into every situation and, and turn it around. But we've got specialists across across our firm. So so um, uh, procurement specialists. Uh, manufacturing specialists, um, customer and ops specialists, um, as well as the financial acumen and rigor that our restructuring people bring to a, to a situation. So it's a holistic, it's a holistic situation. So if we're working on turning around the performance of a business, there'll be various elements of our of, of our firm, and Ferriers would be very much the same. Then on the right. capital side. Um, you know, we get involved in divesting non-core parts of the business, raising alternative capital, refinancing debt. Mm. We play in equity capital markets as, uh, as well. So, right. so there's a number of dis different solutions that we can bring to a situation of, of financial stress in a business. Yeah, the big field of corporate advisory. Well, Matthew, thank you so much for joining us uh, and congratulations again. Thank you, Matthew Woods. Thanks very much. Cheers. All right. Well, after the break, a delay in China trade war negotiations. We'll discuss the current environment with the president of the Australia-China Business Council, John Brumby.
U.S. President Donald Trump is offering to push back a summit with Chinese leader Xi Jinping until a final deal is reached. Mr. Trump told reporters there could be a deal done prior to the summit, which would then just need to be signed. Or the deal could be almost complete, with just some of the final points left to negotiate his preference, I think. The comments represent a shift in tone from late last month when he raised the prospect of a signing summit with Xi. Chinese officials have grown increasingly wary of putting Xi in a position where he might be embarrassed by an unpredictable Trump or forced into last-minute concessions. Well, for more on the current trade situation, I'm very pleased to welcome the president of the Australia-China Business Council, John Brumby, who joins me live from our Melbourne studio. John, nice to see you there. Um, let's, before we talk about Australia-China relations, uh, what is your take on the current situation between the two great leaders? Uh, well, I, th I only know really what I read in the what I read in the media and and what I guess would be on both of their minds, and that is mm. that both of them would like to find a resolution to this, uh, and they'd both like to find a resolution to this because uh, the trade restrictions at the moment, the increased tariffs, are hurting the U.S. economy. Uh, I think they're adding something like three billion U.S. a month to the cost of U.S. manufacturing. Uh, they're hurting American firms like Apple and Caterpillar who are trading yes. into China and of course it's slowing the Chinese economy as we've seen recently with the revised growth rates announced by Li Keqiang of six to six and a half percent. So there's no winners out of trade wars so I think both of them would like to get this right and I think for President Trump he's uh, people tell me he's quite focused um, quite obsessed about the trade deficit uh, it's running at I think 60 billion at the moment and he'd like to see that figure reduced mm. uh, but the best way to reduce it is to get the world economy growing again and to get a sensible agreement in place with China. Right well I noticed that he also said when when questioned uh, would the US technology issue the you know that the sort of nut of this um, dis fallout between China and the US would that have to have to be part of any uh, agreement on, on the trade negotiation uh, and he said yes um, others I've spoken to said well if that's the case this technology uh, tension is going to go on and on and on um, does that make you feel rather the depressed about the possibility of some deal well I think uh, look I look I don't know we, we only know what we read about these matters yeah. but um, I think it was positive that the president opened up uh, that debate a little wider though some of his advisors were uh, quite disturbed by that um, the reality is as I've said before I think the the current US position in terms of technology is not sustainable um, I certainly understand what drives it. There are security concerns and there are concerns that China has become dominant in many technologies, uh, artificial intelligence, some elements of robotics, certainly 5G and telecommunications. And there are concerns in America that they'll never catch China in the future. Mm. But I don't think you can, um, you can disengage from China. I don't think a bifurcated world economy is going to work in the future. And I think we're starting to see um, smart people reach that conclusion now and so while it mightn't come in this trade agreement I think going forward these things will come back on the agenda to get a more common sense approach to how mm. the world grapples with uh, technological issues and technological dominance. Right. Well, uh, John, just on that, and I'm not going to back, go back over old ground. Obviously, you've, you you um, uh, re resigned from the board of Huawei in, in February. But now that you're not uh, directly involved with them, I spoke with Chair John, Australian Chair John Lord, the other day. Um, can can you possibly give us a perspective of where you see this uh, Huawei, uh, the context for the Huawei battle? I mean, people say it's about national security, um, equally there seems to be a very very big trade element to some of the decisions being made around the world about 5G and Huawei. Yeah look um, there's a very good paper which I read recently which um, uh, actually written by John Edwards former Reserve Bank board member and for the Lowy Institute and I think it's very balanced and it goes through all of these issues but he does point out in his paper that uh, as I've said in, in a number of areas in 5G in some elements of artificial intelligence and robotics that China has actually now moved ahead of the United States and this is what's 
driving mm. concern in the United States about technological dominance. So China in many areas has passed them by. And so I think some of the defence and security hardheads are saying the only way to stop this is to disengage from China, um, to rule a line in the, in the concrete, not the sand, yes. and to look at this prospect as a set of a bifurcated world economy. But I, I don't think that can work. And from the perspective of Huawei, I'm not a director anymore. I had eight years on the board. Yes. Um, their sales this year around the world will exceed $100 billion US. Mm -hmm. And the point of that is that integrity is absolutely crucial to their business. The day that they make a mistake or get caught with a secret code or a chip or hand on information is the end of the company. And it's a $100 billion US company in terms of sales every year. And the key to it is product integrity and service integrity. And I think some of the hard heads in the United States, they don't understand that. And that's why I've consistently said the best way to solve this problem going forward in the telecommunications area. You can't draw artificial lines. You can't have a silicon curtain. It's simply not sustainable. Yeah. The best way is to have a variety of vendors, Huawei, Nokia, Ericsson, Cisco, from a variety of countries and to have independent testing of equipment. And I, I yeah. firmly believe that. I don't have the Huawei hat on anymore. Yeah. But when I think of the global economy, you can't draw artificial lines in it and say yeah. oh, on this side of the date line we're going to be using Cisco but on this side of the date line we're going to be using Huawei I just don't think that's a sustainable but so position. You, so you say I'll just ask you one more question on it which is uh, which is that you, you know clearly Australia has um, has implemented as I understand from John Lord a much tougher ban regarding 5G a much more absolute one than some of the other Western nations um, have done although you know there's a deal going ahead with the buses in 4G in the West I notice um, mm. but 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 is it possible that um, you say well look they've only got to make one big mistake mistake and uh, that'll be the end for them as a company that the infrastructure is in though it's very difficult for an organization or a system or a set of government services to say right we've got to just unscramble this egg you know Huawei's been here with the infrastructure we've seen that with uh, TPG for example and, and 4G yeah but, but let's call a spade a spade I mean um, Huawei's been in the Australian market for 15 years. Mm. Uh, we provide the bulk of the equipment to Optus and to Vodafone. Uh, the bulk of the improvements that you've seen in the system in Australia uh, in the last decade in particular, the big reductions uh, in cost for broadband and phone use, the big improvements in quality and movement of data have come about because of Huawei technology. And there's been no security issues at, ever, at all. You know, we've been in Japan, we've been in Europe, we've been in Germany, we've been in the UK. There just haven't been issues and we're part and parcel of the system. So these claims keep being made yes. by people in the United States who've got a barrow to push. And uh, as I said, I can understand what motivates them to push that, but their solution is wrong. To imagine that you can completely exclude the world's biggest and best supplier of telecommunications equipment and now number two in the world in terms of smartphones it's just not real world it's just mm. um, not sustainable and I think my guess is we will see Tiki over the next year or two this debate coming back to a more sensible even keel where consumers can get the benefit of competition and the best technology uh, and, and, and Huawei of, may be able to operate in a larger a larger section of the infrastructure with with other competitors, yep. as I've said, a variety of vendors from a variety yes. of countries and okay. independent testing of equipment. All right, let's come back to Australia-China relations. Uh, I mean, obviously, we've got the US tensions there, but what about our relations with China at the moment? How do you see them in the context of, say, the last decade? Uh, well, in terms of the last decade, I think, um, you know, they're, not, they're still not good. Um, mm. They're better than they were a year ago or 18 months ago, uh, but they're nowhere near as good as they were two and a half years ago when Australia Ch signed the free trade agreement with China and everything was happy and everything was rosy. Mm. So there's still work to do. Whichever government is in power after the next federal election, um, there's work to do to build the relationship, to maintain the relationship. I mean, Tiki, I think the irony is that at state level in Australia, 
whether you're talking about Victoria, which is probably the leader, but Victoria, WA, New South Wales, South Australia, all of the Australian states, they've got outstanding relationships with their counterparts and with the government and with industry in China. It's at a federal level where I think we've been challenged over some natural issues, defence and security issues, and I understand that, but also just some lack of sophistication, some clumsy comments in the past by ministers, um, the daily depiction almost in the press of negative stories about China, yep. and I think that is damaging the relationship. It is not to say it's broken. On the contrary, the economic relationship, the trade relationship, the business-to-business -business relationship is still very strong. And if you look at some of the recent trade growth figures, whether it's in wine or some figures I saw the other day on seafoods and lobster, the, the increase in exports is truly phenomenal. And so, yep. you know, for Australia, this is still our number one issue, I think, to get this relationship right. And there will be issues on which we have differences with China in the future. But I think, as I said, whoever's the incoming government in Australia, they need to be in, in that section. And yes, these are the things we disagree on. But there are so many things that we agree on and we can work together. And let's really focus on those. John Brumby, very nice to talk to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tiki. Now, US President Donald Trump um, has had a bit to do with the Boeing situation as well. He's ordered all Boeing 737 MAX airplanes to be immediately grounded in the wake of the crash of an Ethiopian Airlines aircraft that killed 157 people this last week. Speaking at the White House, President Trump said all pilots and airlines had been notified of the emergency order and all are, are all in support of it. Planes currently in the air will continue to their destination where they'll be stopped. The plane is already banned from operating in Australia and several other nations, with Canada following suit this morning. Satellite tracking data appears to show similarities between the Ethiopian Airlines crash and last year's Lion Air crash in Indonesia. Well, for more on all of this, I spoke with Sky News Melbourne Bureau Chief Aaron Young a little earlier. Aaron Young, you've been following this story from the beginning. A big development today. Very much so, uh, and perhaps a little bit too late. A lot of questions for the FAA and for Boeing. Tiki, you and I have been on the floor of that big Boeing factory, of course, in Seattle. Very fortunate to be there. This is a company that is the gold standard when it comes to aviation. If it's not Boeing, I'm not going, but it seems to be the other way around at the moment, where you're finding a lot of passengers are saying quite the opposite. There's a lot of concern about the future of this program, not just among the airlines who have bought them, but also now for a lot of passengers. This is going to be a huge headache for Boeing when they have the 737 we're all used to flying on it and the next generation aircraft that we currently fly on here in Australia. They're very safe, we have to say. The safest in the world. They always have been. This is an airframe that dates back to the 1950s. The big problem is this new jet, the 737 MAX, which now finally the FAA and Boeing are saying we'll ground until we can figure out what the problem is. So uh, Donald Trump, I understand, has grounded uh, certainly all planes, uh, maxes within American airspace. Is there now more of a connection between the Lion Air crash and the Ethiopian Airlines crash? Yes, and you could tell that straight after the Ethiopian air crash last week when the flight data from the radar organizations on the web showed basically the exact same uh, sort of graph that we saw from Lion Air last year. It essentially takes off, gets to a certain altitude, the pilot gets into difficulty, the nose seems to tip down, they call Mayday, not sure what's happening, try to return to the airport but they never make it and the plane crashes terribly into the ground. So they're now saying that this satellite data has come forward. The problem with that satellite data is we've now been told from the organisation that provides it that they did so on Monday and yet it still took two days for the FAA to take action like this. The FAA and the NTSB in the United States have always been the leaders of global aviation safety. They have to be. There are more Boeings in the skies than any other type of plane, and of course Boeing being an American company. Usually, CASA, our Civil Aviation Safety Authority, takes its cues from the FAA. And I think that the reason a lot of the airlines around the world were at first quite sceptical to pull the Boeing uh, 737 MAX out of their fleet and from flying is because no one thought this could happen to a company like Boeing.
Why do you think it took so long? It appeared that Donald Trump uh, had to tweet for action to be taken within the US. It's a bit frightening, to be honest. I have no idea why it has taken so long, but if you have a look right back to the Lion Air crash last year, straight away we heard from the Indonesian authorities that they had concerns about that plane. In fact, it really accentuated that whole problem, and Boeing started working on a temporary fix. Essentially, what is happening with these aircraft, Tiki, if I can just briefly explain, is a plane takes off as normal, but because they've brought in new engines to make the plane more fuel efficient, 15% more fuel efficient from the older model. They've pushed the engines forward, they're heavier and they're higher. By doing that, the plane is no longer properly balanced in the way that the airframe always has been. So they rely on software to try and overcome that. But what we've been hearing from pilots and this has been anonymously because they have a whistleblower system, the FAA, so that if a pilot is concerned about the safety of a plane, they don't just have to go to their airline, who may or may not deal with it, or the plane manufacturer, who obviously has a lot to, to lose. They then go, they can go to this. And what we're hearing is over recent days, ever since the second crash, the FAA's website has been full of people, pilots, saying that when they pull back on the gear stick, NCAS, which is a software which has been brought in for this new plane type to try and level it out, as I mentioned earlier, well, it's pushing the nose down. That is counterintuitive to anything mm. aviation pilots are used to. You pull that stick back, the plane's meant to go up. When it starts heading down, there's something wrong, they have to deal with it. And twice now, it appears to have led to a fatal crash. Obviously, we don't know for certain whether that is the reason. But as they say, if safety is the number one priority, if there are any doubts, yeah. put those planes on the ground. Briefly, Boeing, obviously, share price has been hit hugely. How long do you think this is going to take to resolve itself for investors? We're hearing months. It will take months to try and resolve this issue, and that's the software issue. I know that after the first crash, the Lion Air crash, we saw Boeing's share price drop. It made even more uh, back from that point until, of course, we've now seen the Ethiopian plane crash as well. We are hearing that that temporary fix to try and turn it into a long-term fix, a lot of pilots are saying it will take months because it has to then go through the certification process at the FAA. And they don't want this happening again. They'll be watching very closely. The bigger problem is going to be a public relations problem for Boeing when it comes to the 737 MAX. Companies in Australia like Virgin Australia paying a huge amount of money for 30 of these aircraft due to be delivered by, well, from the end of this year, from November uh, this year. If they're spending all of this money and the public have doubts about that, there could be a concern. However, we have said the same thing about the 787 when it first entered service. There were so many problems. Yeah. Remember with all those planes in Japan, a and who were the first to take these planes on board. None of them thankfully went down, but there were fires from the lithium batteries. Those planes had a lot of issues, and yet we now see airlines like Qantas and other airlines very happily flying in fact, switching to the 787. So Boeing's gone through this before. They are a very successful, strong company. And when you work in the aviation space, a day can feel like a lifetime. But of course, the next day comes and we all seem to move on. Indeed. Well, terrible tragedies. But let's hope it can be resolved very quickly. Aaron Young, thank you so much for your insights there. Thanks. And after the break, did self-managed super funds get lucky by missing out on the Royal Commission? My interview with John Moroney, CEO of the Self-Managed Super Funds Association, next. This is Tiki on Your Money, covering the big business stories. Welcome back. Now to a bit of a tiff in super. Ian Silk, CEO of Megafund Australian Super, has pointed the finger at the self-managed super fund sector, saying it too should be subject to a Royal Commission-style review. As some of you may remember, I spoke to Mr Silk yesterday. He said a large portion of self-managed super funds are under $500,000 and that many trustees of these small funds aren't even aware that they require an investment strategy. Well, so what does the peak SMF, SF body think of all of that? I spoke with the CEO of the SMSFA, Australia, John Moroni, a little earlier. To catch you on the sidelines there. Now, yesterday I was speaking to uh, Australian Super CEO Ian Silk. Uh, he was a bit tough on the performance of self-managed super funds, particularly those for members with holdings of less than half a million dollars. 
Uh, yes, yes, we uh, did uh, listen to his speech uh, uh, with interest and uh, read some of the, the newspaper uh, reporting uh, about it. Um, um, so our reaction to that is uh, the half million dollar figure uh, has come from the recent report by the Productivity Commission. Mm. Uh, it isn't intended to be a hard sort of level. They've said that some funds under half a million dollars uh, perform relatively poorly uh, compared to uh, our funds in other sectors and, and we accept that and, and uh, part of our role is to uh, assist, educate the trustees in those funds, their advisors, so that uh, they can either uh, improve their performance or potentially migrate out of the, the sector. But uh, it doesn't matter whether it's under half a million or over, uh, no one should be in the sector unless they're getting good advice that it suits them, it's appropriate. It may have been in the past, it may not be in the future, but there's nothing magical about that half million dollar figure. You can certainly have a good, successful, uh, performing self-managed super fund well under half a million dollars and you may struggle to have one that's performing as well. Uh, uh, with much more in there if you don't get the right advice. So advice is crucial to uh, helping people get a good uh, performance and good retirement from their uh, fund, whether it's self-managed or otherwise. I, I guess the issue uh, really is that, uh, as Ian Silk says, it's, it's quite an opaque sector to try and understand. The Productivity Commission had a go. The Australian Council of Trade Unions uh, has backed the, a call for the um, SMSF inquiry. You don't want an inquiry. Why wouldn't that be a good idea? Uh, the main reason we believe it's totally unwarranted is uh, over the past decade there's already been three major inquiries into the uh, sector. So there was the Cooper Review by Jeremy Cooper back in 2010. There was then David Murray's Financial System Inquiry in 2014 and most recently the Productivity Commission, none of which have suggested that the sector needs uh, uh, tightened regulation. They all have indicated it's performing well. It provides a good competitive balance against the rest of the, the super system which uh, we very much strong believe is in uh, competition and, and choice and uh, it's not just helpful within our sector having the opportunity that people that don't want a institutional fund uh, or being forced into institutional fund, it, it's great to have the option of uh, self-management with uh, advisors uh, would be our strong encouragement for most people. Some people are co competent to do it without uh, seeking advice but yeah. most people would benefit from uh, having advice when they start or, or continue. All right. Well, just uh, once again, ASIC uh, is behind a review of the self-managed super funds. Um, Ian Silk again says 30... Oh, sorry, that review that ASIC did, 31% of owner-managers don't know they're required to have an investment strategy and uh, a higher number don't seem to have one anyway. Uh, I mean, isn't that reason enough for an inquiry? The Hain Royal Commission uh, was not given instructions to investigate self-managed super? Uh, that's right. That was outside the terms of reference for the, for the Royal Commission. The Productivity Commission issued two very good reports in the middle of last year. And yes, from a, a relatively small survey, online survey, they did get that finding of 31% uh, not realising they needed an investment strategy. I'm not aware of statistics that say uh, the actual uh, percentage is high. In fact, I think it would be uh, uh, quite the opposite, uh, because uh, but, but isn't the issue, a lot the of issue people is that it's may okay. be overly reliant. And, and, and perhaps in need of a, of a bit uh, of... Um... Well, I think there's two... Uh, uh, well, there's regular st statistics published by the Australian Taxation Office, which is the regulator for the sector, so everyone can go on and look at the most recent statistics, which are updated uh, several times during the, the year. Uh, and um, it has been looked at quite thoroughly by the Productivity Commission and the, the prior reviews that have, that have found it in a, a good state of health. So I, I would uh, query uh, what elements uh, are opaque compared to there are, there's a lot greater level of engagement of members in the self-managed super sector compared to uh, the rest of the system and that's because everyone in there has chosen to be in there. They've usually got advice in going in. Mm -hmm. They get full financial st statements by law so the individuals know exactly what's going on in their, in their fund and we believe the, the vast bulk of them would have the investment strategies even if when they answered a survey uh, they may not have recalled that that was something they went through and I, I think a key point from ASIC is that it is important for the trustees in the sector to be better educated. We're, we're fully uh, supportive of that. We have been running educational uh, uh, activities through our website and events for the last couple of years. We just relaunched our, 
uh, trustee website uh, this week actually so that we can help directly educate as well as help our advisors to educate uh, uh, their clients and prospective clients. So yeah. building a level of understanding on investment issues and regulatory issues and strategy issues is very important but the key way of doing that is, is making sure that people are engaged and uh, we believe there were some flaws in the Productivity uh, Commission's analysis and they've been well documented in, in responses from ourselves mm -hmm. and others so I, I wouldn't be treating uh, some of their findings as, as, uh, uh, as being gospel because there are debates in, in terms of trying to get comparative data analysis between the sectors and so we support their recommendation there needs to be more resource into data collection, consistency, comparability mm. and uh, we also support their recommendation there should be specialist uh, education requirements for those that are advising in the in the sector and we've, so, we've done that for quite a while of saying that's that's something that should be done. So uh, I put it to Ian Silk that there might be another reason why he was being critical of self-managed super and that is that he'd quite like to grow his market share. He's going to uh, have more funds under management than uh, than SMSFs in, uh, in, in, a, in a year or so, I think. Uh, but do you think it, it's, a, it's a market grab as well? Look, I'm sure uh, most, uh, most uh, commercial players would prefer not to have more competition, would prefer less competition. Uh, the Australian Super Fund uh, it, itself is, is a, a, a very good fund. It is one of the high performing funds, so we've got no criticism of it in terms of it's, it's, uh, it's a, a good example for the rest of the industry fund sector to pursue. It's over $100 billion, but in the self-managed super sector there's over $700 billion. Mm -hmm. So we expect uh, uh, there will be a, a uh, continued uh, increase in the level of assets in the self-managed super sector over, over the next 10 years. There may be a slowing of growth of funds of numbers, but uh, most of the money in the retirement phase in Australia is now in the self-managed super fund sector. And I think one good question from that is why are people choosing to leave other funds and come into the sector? Uh, our belief is that they're finding they want more control, that's what the research is saying, but that there hasn't been as much focus on that retirement phase by the whole system compared to what happens in our sector. Yep. And so I think, uh, in general, all the different sectors are good. They can all improve, as both the Productivity Commission and Royal Commission said. We are putting our efforts into improving our part of the sector. We would encourage uh, all the other participants to also work that's in imp improving their sector and making sure everyone focuses on the best interests of the members because that's what it should be all about. That's a very good point you make about the focus on the retirement phase because of course there's been a huge amount of focus on the accumulation phase. What do you make of these um, uh, new ideas around uh, using the family home, um, accessing equity in the family home to put alongside uh, your super, uh, particularly for baby boomers who haven't had the benefit of accumulating compulsory super right from the get-go. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good and interesting question. Uh, there are a number of commercial players that are moving into that uh, area, but also the government is offering uh, what used to be restricted to pensioners with the pension alone scheme. That is now broadly available to all retirees if they do want to access some of the, the capital in their home and have that as a debt that can be paid off uh, at the time uh, after they've finished their retirement phase, shall we say. And um, I think those uh, developments and innovations are quite positive because there is a lot of capital uh, locked up in homes, particularly where you've had large family homes that people are holding on to uh, and they are wanting to access it for either retirement income purposes and quite often for aged care purposes because the, the cost of ageing is, is not just uh, income side, it's health, it's aged care. If you do need high levels of either home care or moving into residential aged care, having that capital available in a home or in your superannuation fund uh, are, are very important protections and a lot of people in retirement are conservative of how they draw down their uh, retirement capital because they don't know what their health needs will be for themselves, for their partner. Mm. And uh, we need to make sure that all those issues are considered. And that's, that's why we'd also support the Productivity Commission's recommendation for a broad review of the, uh, the whole workings of the superannuation system, the retirement income system, uh, the tax system, and not have ad hoc changes that are cherry picking revenue like the proposal for changing franking credit rules. We think mm. that would be very detrimental, it would be unfair, it's discriminatory and uh, it's much better to do a review that deals with the key issues of improving fairness rather than increasing unfairness. John Moroney, great to get your views there. Thank you so much. Thanks Tiki, my pleasure. And after the break, Shamara Wickramanayake graces the March cover of The Deal. Editor Helen Trinker next. Now, back to...
to Tiki. Yes, welcome back. Now, the Australian's newest issue of The Deal comes out tomorrow. On the cover, the quiet achiever, quote-unquote, Macquarie's newish CEO, Shimara Wikrama Nayaki. For more on that, I spoke with the editor of The Deal, Helen Trinker, earlier today. Helen Trinker, Shamara Wikramanayake. Now, that's it's quite a name, but not much of a profile. No, it's it's extraordinary, really. She is the absolute boss now, of course, of Macquarie. Yeah, one of and, our, and the it girl of the top mm, floor, you know. Absolutely, and one of our biggest, most successful, you know, most fabulous companies here and globally. Mm -hmm. And she's managed to keep a pretty low profile and it looks as if she might continue to do so because mm. we have done a story about her in the next issue of The Deal, which is out tomorrow. But we haven't, we weren't able to get an interview with her. We hope to get that in the future. Yes. What's fascinating is that she's in the, she's following the um, Macquarie uh, playbook really yes. a, uh, of the last few years, and you have, you know, would know this as well, Tiki. Mm. Macquarie has made an art form of uh, being fairly um, holding a pretty tight ship, really, and uh, they, I think they even encourage their board members not to sort of, you know, be too much in the in the media. Well, they're so on script, aren't they? And and then Nicholas Moore had that just perfect innings at the Royal Commission, mm. didn't he? I mean, mm. a lot of people from the sidelines were going, "Hang on a minute," you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but it was it was a perfect mm. performance, mm. Um, and then and then handing over to Shamara. Uh, who um, is doing, as you say, just the same mm. thing. And look, she's obviously incredibly well, um, you know, uh, she's incre it's an cr incredibly good appointment, you know, yes. no one's suggesting... Well, she's very you know, she's well done, credentialed, Yeah, isn't very she? well credentialed. And she has done a long sort of apprenticeship with him, you know, yes. I mean, that's the wrong sort of word, really, because she's been his sort of almost his equal, I suppose. But, you know, this is the way the Macquarie does it. They don't have shock. They don't have shocks to the system. And it's interesting, though, because we set off, and Joyce Malouakis, our, our banking writer, set off to try to sort of see a bit more, you know, find out a little bit more about Shamara. And one of the things we, I guess we found was that it didn't used to be quite so tight, Macquarie. It mm -hmm. used to be under the former bosses, um, David Clark and Alan Moss. Alan Moss yeah. They were slightly more open, really, with the media. And uh, particularly, I suppose, David Clark, he's quite a bon vivant. Yes. Uh, and um, I think it's really been more Nicholas's style, Nicholas Moore's style, and he has pulled back in a tighter. They got a bit burnt a couple of times, you know, yeah. and, like he went on Alan Jones, I think, and got burnt, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's think... also very much the investment banking mm. type, you know, sort mm. of when you think of people like Matthew Grounds. And I mean, these are all people that, uh, you know, the Australians uh, deal, deal deal makers mm. might might end up talking to at some stage or other but yeah. very difficult for front of house uh, yeah. interviews mm. with and these look, people. To, to some extent they don't need to do it you know they're not in a sort of a retail bank you know mm. they don't have to sort of uh, be in good favour, for example, with mm. the community, like the, the, the other big four banks have yeah. to do at the moment. So that's one thing. But of course, one of the other things that's interesting is we also did a piece and have done a piece in the magazine about CEOs who do believe it's important to, to speak out. And we yep. talked to Tony Shepherd, former you know BCA. Um, well, he's got uh, his uh, he's got his stadiums. Yes, which are being pulled. Yes, the absolutely. Being pulled you know, he's chairman of the MC, uh, SCG, you know, isn't he? And, and he tells it tells Damon uh, Kit Kitney that he doesn't mind being sort of called basically. I think you know um, motor mouse, you know, because he he does believe you know that you've got to sort of make some statements. Diane Smith Gander, as well, board director, she says you know you've got to use mainstream media to get your, your point of view across. You know, when yeah. she was. Um, President of Chief Executive Women and yeah. had a very successful time there. Well, and that's she a very really, close issue yeah, to her heart. To her, it, it is. But yeah. she raised the profile of CW really quite yes. strongly yes. because she was quite. Um, you know, courageous, I suppose, or gutsy, you know, in terms of being able to speak out and not being anxious about it. So and also a woman that was uh, at one stage, you know, running detention centres or chairing, yeah, you know, that's right. she had detention centres. It, it wasn't, uh, wasn't easy stuff. No, exactly. And so um, she's been sort of active. And, of course, we also look a little, just, you know, briefly at people like Alan Joyce. And, of course, um, Alan has been had quite a public profile and a particularly public one, I suppose, during the same-sex um, marriage debate. Yeah, you know, so more front. advocacy. Yeah, that yeah. was almost advocacy. So there is a really big issue, I think, for um, you know CEOs here and in the states yeah. um, about how active, you know, how much activism should you engage in? You know, do you have to, you know, if you're too far ahead of your uh, employees or your customers, you know, that obviously you, there can be a problem there. But it's very interesting, and it's just a really interesting thing to look, I think, at Macquarie. 
at a different kind of uh, approach to it. And in the at the same time, obviously, we talk to other people about um, Shamara, who, as yeah. you say, is the it girl. And uh, I just think she's quite interesting. She's been very active in the community. See, this is what's interesting. It's well, not she like does she's all done her philanthropic nothing. stuff. Mm. I did um, actually through the American Chamber of Commerce manage to get an, a, an interview with her shortly mm. after she first started. But um, it was, you know, it was a very sort of it's one on specifically mm. infrastructure mm. rather mm. than too much on her. Yeah. She's a workaholic. Is she? She yes, passed yeah. herself in mm. the air on mm. planes, and mm. and um, yeah. and so she is. Um, she's. I think part of that she uses, doesn't she, to sort of say, well, actually, I'm too busy yeah, for all this. Yeah, yeah that's um, right. Look, she's ex she's obviously extraordinary. I mean, you do not get to that level, yeah. um, and uh, without being fairly pretty extraordinary. I mean, yeah. Nicholas Moore was extraordinary. You know, they are incredible CEOs, yeah. and um, and I think that they. Um, you know, part of me, obviously as a journalist, what you want to do is you want to have CEOs who talk and when if you ring them up, they agree to be on the cover and all yes. that sort of thing. But you can sort of see also how there's a really, um, you know, if you are in a business and you uh, want to manage it in a different way, you know, yeah. it can be quite appropriate to and take And I think there's some profile. power to a bit of mystique. I think Joyce mm. Malak has done a great job actually describing Shamara mm. um, and going back through some of the, some of the deals mm. that she's involved with. Yeah. Um, but I think there's probably some power to uh, mm. remaining a little bit aloof. Mm. Well, she's a poster girl at the moment, really, for diversity, of course, as yeah. well, with her Sri Lankan background. Um, that's, that's true, And, right, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me. I mean, she, yeah, it, it is, she is a very uh, interesting, you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting appointment. And, look, it doesn't, sit, doesn't look as if it's, she's, look, at it, all, the, all the pointers are that she's going to do a brilliant job, yes. too. You know, like, it's not as if she's untried or untested in yeah. the Macquarie culture. But she's got to do it. Culture. Yeah, she's got to do it. Um, and one other, while I've got you there, that uh, that you mentioned on this list of, of people who are prepared to speak out, speak out Jane Herdlicker, yeah. who was originally running Jetstar for Alan Joyce. Um, but she's got a, a very good growth story to tell, so she's talking. Yeah, I've, uh, indeed. And in some ways, she's probably been slightly, um, you know, I'm not say, suggesting she says this, but I think she's probably been slightly let off the leash in a way. Way because probably uh, at, at uh, Qantas or Jetstar, mm. she had a lower sort of profile, obviously, because um, Alan's was is the number one. So I think she's good. I mean, I think Jane's fantastic. Every time I see her at the tennis, because she's of course chair, I think of the um, lawn. She loves it. You know, the, she? the tennis. Yeah. You know the Australian Open, and so at the Australian Open, I remember the first time I saw her. She jumped up on the court, you know, and just spoke to this, you know, huge group of people, um, so casually and effectively, you know, yeah. on the sort of closing, um, pre you know, uh, presentation of the um, of the awards. And, and she's got this great story to tell. Yeah, today too. exactly. You know, so she's you know she's been more um, she's been more open, and I think I think it's really interesting to see people. See, it's not easy, I think, as a CEO or as a boss to sort of be um, out there because you can get cut down. So to have the kind of inner confidence, I think, to be able to do it. Mm. And I think um, Diane smith Gand is a very good example of that. You know, she went out on a limb a few times mm. over the women's issues about quotas, etc., at a time when nobody was prepared to say very much. And she's got that capacity, I think, to sort of weather the storm, you know, and if it comes at you, just sta keep standing. Helen Trigger, thank you. Thank you. That's all for the show tonight. Tomorrow night, Trade Minister Simon Birmingham. Thanks for your company.